Welcome back to Roadshow News Recap. Overall, this has been a pretty quiet week, but of course, there's still some important news to discuss. Tesla superchargers, Elon Musk seems to hint that they might be opening these to other automakers. Mercedes-Benz showed off a super efficient new concept called the EQXX prototype. The 2023 Chevrolet Corvette Z06 has been teased. Very interesting clip you're going to have to check out. And then there's some, some Rivian news as well. Another possible production delay. And then the company may be opening a second factory. So very interesting stuff there. Uh, but before we dive into all of this, we do have some very important news to share with you guys, our audience. Sean, if the clip are you there? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear, Craig. Let's get rolling then. Welcome to Roadshow News, our brand spanking new spin-off channel. Whether it's our weekly broadcast on Fridays, other live streams, or even breaking news hits, there's a little something for everyone. And like finding money in your pants pocket or discounted tacos, we think you're really going to love it. Subscribe today for weekly updates and maybe even some coupons. Well, maybe not coupons, but do what he said and subscribe. Yep, you heard it right, folks. Roadshow News Recap, your favorite weekly live program that discusses automotive news and stuff. We're moving. Yes, we're moving to the canceled channel at never o'clock. No, 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 that's not true, Craig. We're actually moving to a brand new channel. Can you believe it? They're giving us our own YouTube channel. That's a lot of responsibility, Craig. <laughs> I'm a little concerned, honestly. I wouldn't trust me with that. Yeah, right. But no, this new channel is called Roadshow News, and you can find it by searching Roadshow News on YouTube. Uh, it's going to have different content. Our live show is still going to be there. Uh, we'll have some quick news hits there to react more quickly to the news. Um, and we're still experimenting. We might have more there too. So mm -hmm. it's going to be fun. We're excited to welcome you all there now. It is set up. So please go subscribe, bookmark that channel, ring the bell, all that good stuff. Uh, and you'll find it. And, uh, that's where we'll be going forward. Yes. So Roadshow News on YouTube, give a search a roo for that. And as Sean said, subscribe and we will be broadcasting uh, the Roadshow News Recap live every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern on that channel going forward. So this is our last broadcast on the traditional Roadshow YouTube channel. So now you all know where to find us in the coming weeks. But back to the topic at hand, Tesla, Elon Musk making some news again this week. He tweeted again, as he is wont to do, uh, about potentially opening superchargers up to other EVs, which, as I understand, Sean, this is not the first time he's done that. It's not. Uh, there's at least one other time that I know we're aware of that uh, Elon has been asked this question uh, or responded to this kind of question of somebody asking, when are you going to let other electric vehicles uh, charge at a supercharger station? And it's always been, yes, it's going to happen. And it's been like three or four years and it, it hasn't happened yet. So this time, you know, we're like, wow, that's big news. But, you know, we still got to take our grain of salt because this has been promised for, you know, a few years now. Um, I yeah. think it will happen. I don't necessarily see the downside other than Tesla starts to lose a competitive advantage. But I'm sure they'd come mm -hmm. up with some sort of pricing scheme for people who don't drive Teslas, you know, a, a, a more of a surcharge or something like that. Probably yes. good for profits in the end, but I don't balance books for a living. I'm sure those people there are much smarter than I. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So because like on the one hand, you can make a strong argument that, you know, Tesla would not want to open its supercharger network up to other car, uh, another, other EVs, because it's sort of like their killer app, right? They've got the best network in the business right now. So why have other companies sort of mooch off of their success that they spent a lot of money in many years building, right? This cross country network. Um, but maybe there's a way to make some money off of it. Like you said, Sean, with surcharges or, 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 or other fees, um, and it could be a major profit generator for them going forward. Once I think EV market penetration gets to a certain point, right? It may not be there just yet, but 
in a couple years. Maybe it will be even better, and then it'll make a good business case for Tesla. But uh, we were actually, some po folks were talking about that in the YouTube chat before the show even started. Barry W. said, I'm not convinced it will happen in any significant numbers. One of the great benefits Tesla have is its walled garden of superchargers. And he's kind of skeptical there. He says, will it re really share? And I don't know. That's really is, funny. Is Musk great. to be believed? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's so funny. I don't know. That, that's so funny they used uh, the the walled garden thing because I actually looked up one of our older reports on this while you were looking, and the quote from Elon Musk in 2018 when asked about opening up the supercharger network to other EVs, he said, "This is not a walled garden." Is his quote. <laughs> so it's just funny <clears throat> that person used that. Uh, I don't know if they'd seen that or remember that as well, but that yeah. was just funny because I, I looked that up and then that person said that. Fascinating. Fascinating. And then uh, Derek in the YouTube chat as well said, I hope Tesla only opens it up to companies that solely make EVs like Aptera and Rivian, something it would force legacy auto companies to step up if they want access. And that's that's an entirely possible thing that uh, Musk could do as well. Limit the supercharger network to uh, smaller or other uh, EV only automakers? Because does, does Tesla really wanna you know, encourage people to buy Mustang Mach-E's or Chevrolet Bolt mm -hmm. EUVs? I don't know, probably not. Yeah, it, yeah, I don't, yeah, there's like so many good arguments for either side, I feel like. Like on one hand, like, yeah, it makes sense, you know, because uh, Elon has always said like, Tesla is a company that is, solely here to promote sustainable energy and stuff like that. So if you look at that argument, you'd say they'd be more than happy to share the supercharger network because that means more people could be like, oh, hey, like I, I can't afford a Tesla or I just don't want a Tesla, but I have a supercharger station near me when maybe there isn't an EVgo station, a charge point mm -hmm. station, Electrify America. I mean, uh, Craig, Craig, you and I were talking before the show and, and really – the supercharger network, I think, is the most impressive thing Tesla has done. Like, I'm not saying that as a hot take because their cars are also impressive. But in terms of having the foresight to say, we are going to invest in a nationwide network of chargers. So no mm -hmm. Tesla owner is burdened by feeling any sort of range anxiety or they're traveling from state to state and they have to really plan their route. I mean... I live in Northeastern Ohio, and guess what the most common electric vehicle charging station is even here? Tesla supercharger stations. They're at Sheets, <laughs> they're at Walmart. I mean, they, they they really are everywhere. Yeah, well, that's the main benefit of Tesla to your to your point that their network is is the biggest achievement that they've done, arguably. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they do going forward. Uh, we we could always reach out to the Tesla PR department, right? Get a straight no, answer on this, I'm sure. Hmm, why is that? <laughs> hmm. Well, uh, I, I want to say it was a, about a year and a half ago they decided to fold that department uh, and uh, haven't heard a peep from them since. Literally, <laughs> we you here we use Elon Musk's Twitter feed as kind of like PR statements. Like if he responds to Basically, something, yeah, we, we take that as that's the company's word because we literally don't have anyone to call or email or speak with to ask a yeah. question or make sure something is correct. So um, that's why we even discussing this, we have to take it with a grain of salt. Because, you know, Elon, smart man, but you don't know, maybe he could be getting ahead of himself. There could be somebody else in the company like, no, no, don't say that. Like, it's not ready yet or yeah. who knows. But Well, like SEC yeah. investigation, right, over tweets a year or two ago. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's so where this news is coming from. Yeah, about yes. three days ago, Mr. Musk tweeted out, yeah, we're making our supercharger network open to other EVs later this year. So we've got, what, yep. five months or so, four months or so left in the year. So we'll see if they make good right. on that promise. But I think it would be a great thing for them to do. Aaron Bounds in yeah. the YouTube chat says, Tesla opening superchargers is a huge positive for them and EVs as a whole. The only problem is that other cars can't take the juice. So, yeah, I mean, right. Tesla can, can suck up those electrons right quick. Not necessarily mm -hmm. the case with a Nissan Leaf or something, but... <laughs> 
Yeah, that's that's something we were also talking about is, you know, would Tesla sell some sort of accessory part to people who don't own Tesla so they can use a supercharger station? Uh, I mean, because Tesla has its own unique uh, port. Um, and yeah. uh, Elon has sa- Elon has said they did that just because there really wasn't much of a standard when they started building cars at scale. Understandable. But today, most cars, mm-hmm. when it comes to uh, DC fast charging, they use the CCS standard. Um, and actually, uh, there are CCS backwards compatible cables for Teslas so they can charge at other stations. But I don't believe that plug is actually on sale in the US yet. I believe that might just be mm-hmm. in Europe. But there's so many questions with, uh, you know, CCS versus the Tesla plug. You know, how would somebody, you know, running that CCS plug plug into a supercharger? There'd have to be some sort of port connector. Hopefully our Mm -hmm. EVs don't become like Apple, Mac, iPhone things and it doesn't become. You need a dongle. You bought a MacBook Pro, (laughs) you need a dongle. (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running dongle hell right now. I have a big block that can fit like four different plugs into it because... Yeah, that's a different discussion. You can't charge an iPhone on a MacBook. Oh my God. (laughs) You can't? No, there's no lightning port. No, there's no lightning port. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yep. That that went (laughs) away. Because that makes sense. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, man. Oi, oi, oi. But uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, this could be real huge news. But a related story to uh, the potential opening of the supercharger stations is Tesla actually closed its very first supercharger station this past Monday, Craig. That's sad. Why'd they do that? Yeah. Yeah. Why would they do that? What the heck? But (laughs) uh, (laughs) supposedly, uh, and this is coming based off of some social media photos and um, users who typically would go to that supercharger station. Uh, There was a sign posted. I believe this first circulated on Reddit. Uh, saying the station was closing as of July 19th. And it has to do, according to the people who posted these photos, uh, with security concerns, is people would come to the supercharger station, which, by the way, is located at Tesla's design studio. So, like, you're driving behind SpaceX headquarters and whatnot to get to this station, and people would, like, mosey into the lobby and start like poking around going places they're not supposed to while they're waiting for their tesla to charge and i guess tesla was just like we can't have this any longer um apparently some conference rooms are visible from this station you know if they're showing you know Mm. the the tesla model z or something on a slideshow Uh you know anyone charging their car could be like look at that and take a picture but um yeah, that, so that was an interesting reason to close it. Um, but I'm and sure a, a bit reason, of a sentimental. Frankly. <laughs> no, it's yeah. a very, it's a very understandable reason for sure. Uh, just you know, kind of sad. But uh, anyone in that area, there's, uh, I, I guess, a supercharger station across the street at Target. So go get your Starbucks at Target, pick up some toiletries, and charge your Tesla yep. at Target. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Aaron Bounds in the YouTube chat says proprietary Tesla charger is an easy fix. It's the onboard charger on the vehicle that can only take a certain kilowattage, 50, 75, whatever. The version three of the supercharger provides up to 250, he says. So, yeah, if your vehicle can't absorb the juice as quickly as the supercharger can pump it out, then it's not going to do you much good. So sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they're they're even saying. That or I, again, I think Elon said in a tweet, I believe we did a report story on this, is they want to send out a round of updates to those V3 stations and bump it to 300 kilowatts. Whew. So that could be some serious power for Tesla cars that a super valid point. If your car can only accept, I don't know, 125 or something like that, you know, then like mm-hmm. there could be some is- some issues going on there. So that's a good point. Very astute. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Michael in the chat says, do you think there will be a different cost to people without Teslas? And I would say almost certainly, pure speculation, of course, but I would say almost certainly because this could be a major profit generator for Tesla. Once there gets to be enough other EVs out on the road, which we know is coming because every automaker is 
hard at work on a, a whole new fleet of EVs. So uh, that could turn the supercharger network into a major profit generator for Tesla. And that might actually help sell more Teslas because if you get uh, preferential charging, a, a lower cost <laughs> for having a Tesla at the supercharger, uh, that could help drive more people to those as well. So very interesting decisions from Tesla. Yeah, but, we're, um, we'll have to wait and see. Of, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but speaking of other electric vehicles, Mercedes-Benz had a press conference, a press event online the other day, and basically they announced their electrif electrification strategy going through the end of the decade. And essentially, they're going to be building all EVs uh, by the end of this decade. And in that presentation, they also showed a new uh, prototype vehicle called the Vision EQXX, uh, which sort of encapsulates their electrification efforts. You can see uh, the photo they released of it right there, one solitary little image, but looks like a pretty cool car, eh? I think it looks pretty cool from that teaser image. I mean, granted, it's a, you know, a terrible look at the car, <laughs> but it, you know, I think it looks cool just the way it's sitting there staring at us menacingly. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think it does look pretty cool. Uh, they, you know, they gave us a few uh, small details, uh, which Craig will dive into in a moment. But the thing mm -hmm. about this prototype is they don't, they, they're probably not going to build it. They're going to premiere it next year, they say, but it doesn't directly foreshadow a production car. Basically the engineers working on this, they want to pack all this technology into a prototype car and then let it trickle down to the forthcoming production EVs is what they're saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, some of their goals with the EQ, EQ, VQXX, they want 1,000 kilometers of range. That's about 621 miles. Uh, and they want to do that with what they called a normal sized battery because anyone could deliver 1,000 kilometers of driving range. Just pack the car with batteries, make the whole thing a battery. And there you go. You suddenly got a thousand Drive a kilometers. battery. Uh, but that's <laughs> basically, yes, a physical battery you can climb inside. But that's not what the Mercedes-Benz engineers are looking to do. They want to, to deliver that range with a, your typical sized battery in this vehicle. Um, and they want super efficiency too. They want um, about six miles per kilowatt hour when driven at highway speeds, not just trundling along in the city. So their plans to try and deliver those goals, they're going to go for extraordinary aerodynamics. They're going to make the car super slippery, supposedly even more aerodynamic than the new, uh, what is it, the EQS luxury sedan they came out with, which we should have mm -hmm. a review on shortly, as I know our uh, yes. roadshow Andrew Croc drove that recently. So be on the lookout yes. for that. Um, fantastic aerodynamics. Uh, also, 20% greater energy density in the battery cells is what they're targeting. How they're going to achieve that, they don't really say, but it's probably some stuff that's still, you know, in R&D at this point. So greater energy density, much improved aerodynamics, and then vehicle-wide efficiency improvements is what they're targeting. So I, I would assume that means lighter weight components. I would think uh, a more efficient climate control system, maybe using like a heat pump instead of like a traditional arrangement uh, and, you know, maybe thinner glass or something. So we'll see if Mercedes-Benz can deliver that, but a thousand kilometers of uh, range, more than 600 miles of range in a vehicle with a normal size battery sounds pretty impressive to me. Sean, what do you think? I, I mean, I... Craig, you worked this presentation and then I, I kind of jumped in to help you out uh, when this news was was going down and I, I took on the story for the uh, EQXX prototype and I, I kind of framed it as everything I'm reading is like they want to leapfrog Tesla so badly. I mean, I think any <laughs> automaker does. They want to be Tesla. So I have a feeling this prototype car is going to be the Germans trying to stick it to Elon Musk's company because those are some. Yeah, it's huge, a point of pride, huge, right? Yeah, I mean, those are huge promises in terms of range and that efficiency. The efficiency number is what's really intriguing because you can build a car with 500, 600 miles of range, an electric car. But if mm -hmm. it like sucks the battery juice down like super quickly, then like what's the point of having all of that range? So you combine a long range with super great efficiency, 
and you have a really phenomenal package, especially if they're talking, I think, uh, the translation, I'm assuming from German to English, the translation, Uh it came back as a compact car battery. I don't know exactly what Uh that means by definition, but they're saying they want this to be right. They want this to be a really small battery. So that could, will potentially keep the weight down too. So this -hmm. could be kind of a game changing car if they deliver and say, we have this stuff ready to go. It's going in our production vehicles coming in the next three, five years or so. Um, I, I, I think it yeah. could be tremendous for Mercedes-Benz. As Aaron mentions in the chat, uh, people, a lot of people are obsessed with driving range in an EV, which in the early days, or if you live in like International Falls, Minnesota, where it gets super cold in the winter, it still matters. But as the recharging infrastructure gets built out, it matters less and less, I think, right? Because you don't want to be carrying around this several thousand pound battery arrangement that gives you that range if you don't need it right if you can charge up in 20 minutes or less you know literally anywhere it's not a problem like if there are high speed charging stations there's common as gas stations i mean what you're fine right i i know and I, i think we talked about a study in the past that said most people do their charging at home um, you know, the, yeah. on a, a level two charger or something like that. Uh, and they just leave it plugged in and, you know, boom, you're good. It's, you know, it's not every day. Here's how I look at it because there's actually an EV in the garage outside a, a personal vehicle. Um, you don't gas your car up every single day. You don't charge your EV every single day. It's, it's the same. It's just, we're, we're talking about different energy usage, you know, so you drive, you know, 80 some miles in a gasoline powered car, uh, then maybe you're at, you know, you've spent a quarter of a tank or a half tank, whatever, however large the tank is. You do that in an EV, you've depleted some of the range. At some point in either car you're driving, you're going to get some sort of anxiety if you're on the highway and you're creeping closer to empty or range depletion. It's, it's, for me, it's a bit apples to apples. The only thing is with an EV, you kind of got to plan it a little bit more to make sure if you are driving further that there's a station nearby and you stop sooner rather than later. Um, uh, that's kind of my take on it. Uh, but Mm -hmm. yeah, especially as the infrastructure starts to, especially as the infrastructure starts to build out. Uh, I don't see the need to have, you know, like 600 miles of range. I mean, is there a gasoline or diesel vehicle that does 600 miles on a tank? It might be a thing. I don't even know, but your bladder won't last that long. No, (laughs) yeah, you're going (laughs) to, yeah, you're going to, you're going to stop to, to use a restroom and pick up a snack or something. And that's when you put gas or diesel in your car anyway, assume, you know, presumably. Yeah. So you mentioned, Sean, you got, and I know the answer to this, but you have a personal EV in the garage that you're making monthly payments on. Chat room, chat rooms, plural. Take a stab at what Sean is paying for right now. I'd like to, I'm curious to see what you guys think. And we'll, we'll tell you a little bit later in the show. I think he made a good choice. Yeah. Yeah. But yes. Yes. We'll let you know a little bit later. Craig's making games up on the spot. But, uh, That's right. I'm anyway, trying, to be, trying to engage the people, Sean. Come on. Yeah, we're here. Yeah, we're here to talk with you. Have fun with us. It's Friday. Gosh <laughs> darn it. But uh, anyway, gosh darn it. Uh, gosh darn it. Uh, we're moving away from electric vehicles with this next story because Chevrolet happened to tease a new Corvette this week, and it's none other than the new Z06. Uh, so this announcement should have anyone who is remotely interested in Corvettes pretty pumped because the video they released sounds a lot like there's a flat plane crank V8 under the hood, Craig, uh, dual overhead cam. And mm-hmm. by the way, the title of this video is called crank it up is what they called it. So that seems kind of like an indicator that we're looking at a major change for a production Corvette. Um, mm-hmm. I think Evan's trying to play a little bit of the sound there so you guys can hear it. Yeah, there that it does is. not sound like your typical Corvette. No, it all, but to my yeah. ear, it almost sounds synthesized. It doesn't sound real. I don't know. So well, what I makes think me what they wonder... were doing was like flicking through like some of the digitalization with the, that. Um, but yeah, I, I get what you're saying, but 
almost certainly this is a dual overhead cam flat plane crank v8 uh and i say that because the c8r race car uh that uh chevrolet or corvette racing uh races is now running an engine just like that it's a 5.5 liter it displaces um no turbo it's naturally aspirated and they're gonna have to homologate that engine somehow so looks like it's gonna go into the z06 <laughs> be pretty sweet do we know if this is based is this its own thing or is this 5.5 liter v8 based on like the blackwing engine or or something else do we have any idea no, uh, it shouldn't be based on anything else. This should be pretty new as far as I understand, uh, new to this vehicle. Um, we could see, well, well, number one, the Z06 should be naturally aspirated. It will not have a turbo um, as far as I know. Um, and then moving forward, some other variants may slap a turbo on this engine to put even more power out. Um but yeah, I think we're looking somewhere in terms of horsepower, 600 some horsepower, uh, as I believe were some sounds rumored figures we saw. Yeah, I mean, this this sounds like uh, it is a delicious number. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what constitutes a delicious number, Craig? Give us an explanation. I think once you hit 500, that's when it starts to get pretty tasty. Mm. <laughs> Mm, although, tasty. although okay. just like we were talking a, a minute ago about having huge range in a car, Huge horsepower is kind of the same way, right? Like you get past, yeah. depending on the vehicle, of course, but you get past, you know, 300. It's a question of how much do you really need? Like mm -hmm. you're in a high performance car, you hit the gas and it's like, oh, okay, I'm doing double the speed limit in like 10 seconds. Okay, great. That was fun. Like it's, it's just effortless. Yes. So. Yeah. yeah. I, I totally agree on that. I'm more of a slow car, fast kind of person, usable power where mm -hmm. you're not getting into trouble by the time you're in second gear yes. going a hundred miles an hour or something like that. <laughs> yes. But, um, uh, yeah, uh, this, or, uh, Chevy's calling this a supercar, And I'm kind of thinking, I'm like, is this finally when Chevy makes a Corvette? That's kind of like America's Ferrari kind of thing, you know, because this yeah. is a very exotic move for the Corvette. And, you know, obviously it's going to still be the C8 mid engine layout, uh, which is already rather exotic to begin with uh, by moving the configuration around and going that route for the latest generation Corvette. Um, so I, I wonder if it may uh, attract some people who typically don't look at Corvettes. I don't think it's going to be stealing yeah. Ferrari buyers uh, in the slightest, but um, it, I don't they know. They have too much money to spend. Away. They don't need to buy a Chevy no matter how fast yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, isn't, isn't the thing with people who shop Corvettes it, or or like the, the wealthy clientele that may want to buy a Corvette, but they can't be bothered going to a Chevy dealer because like literally the Corvette is there and then next to it on the showroom floor is like a Chevy Trax, which costs like 20 grand, yeah. <laughs> you know, and you just, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just a very, very different experience than going to like a boutique Ferrari dealer where like the least expensive car costs more than what my house is worth. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> funny that Derek is speculating in the YouTube chat here I wonder if the Z06 is going to have some form of hybrid system perhaps the first all wheel drive Corvette any idea Sean uh, it should not be the Z06 uh, it may be another variant coming a name tossed around for that is Zora uh, we could see a Zora mm -hmm. uh, and that's uh, a, a uh, what do you want to call it honoring uh, Zora Arcus Duntov. Uh, he's kind of the father of the Corvette. I'm sure Corvette people know about him. If you don't look it up because he was an interesting figure and literally his entire dream while working on Corvette programs was to turn the Corvette into a mid engine car. And it didn't happen until decades after he had passed away. So, uh, yeah, it's rumored that we may see his name grace a Corvette and it could feature hybrid power and all wheel drive. Be very cool. Um, mm -hmm. moving along though, uh, we got to talk about Rivian, very yes, innovative uh, electric vehicle startup company, a couple stories about mm -hmm. Rivian here. Um, uh, delays though, unfortunate, the, uh, R1T and R1S have both been pushed back. The R1T, that's the truck variant is now expected to arrive in September and the R1S they're projecting later in the fall. I guess they were supposed to arrive uh, originally early in 2020, but obviously, it's mid 2021 now. So that kind of didn't happen. 
Um, <laughs> but but uh, they're citing of. pandemic related. <laughs> yeah, we're a little behind schedule. But uh, they're citing, of course, pandemic related challenges, which obviously are a huge problem for the entire automotive industry, among many other industries. So uh, not surprising these vehicles got pushed back, especially for a smaller company like a startup. I mean, you don't have the capacity and, and, and the staff and, and everything like a GM does. So I think delays can sort of snowball when you're at a smaller organization like that. But yeah, yeah, unfortunate to see, but it sounds like it won't be too long of a delay at this point, at least until they delay them again, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that how it goes? But no, hope, hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully there aren't too many issues to come. Uh, you know, Rivian still seems very, very promising. Uh, you know, our own Emmy Hall drove an R1T in the uh, Rebel rally. And she uh, did a write-up on it, which you can find at theroadshow.com. This was a while ago. Um, but she called it a game changer because she said it was a fantastic truck that was, you know, rough and tough. It handled the off-road courses fantastically. Um, they had an innovative way of charging it on this uh, rally as well, which was pretty cool. So you can see more stuff about that at theroadshow.com, searching yeah. for it. But, uh, yeah. I mean, really, Riv Rivian was the company that felt like the next the next Tesla to so many people is like they're yeah. they they seem they seem innovative they're splashy the vehicles look like nothing else on the road you know they came around in like what 2017 or something like that is when we saw concepts mm -hmm. for the R1T and R1S um, and they feel so close they just need to actually start building cars uh, cars for yes. the public because they have a couple lines running at their uh, normal Illinois plant and one of them is doing like pre-production work on uh, new amazon delivery vans uh, if people have Ooh. seen those it's like the the cutest Fun. little delivery van you've ever seen with its round circle headlights and stuff like that so um i think rivian's pretty much poised for success it's just it's they're just taking their time to make sure they get it right is what it sounds like um if no one knows yeah, they have you don't a want lot to launch of money. a car and have yeah sorry go ahead no, I was just going to say they have a lot of money and a lot of money from Amazon. <laughs> I, I can bet. Uh, because like the last thing you want to do is launch a new EV and then have problems with, you know, I don't know, battery fires or something. Because uh, didn't Chevy something like that. have some trouble with the Bolt? Yeah, you don't want that. Today. That's bad, folks. <laughs> when your EV catches yeah. on fire, you don't want that. This is now this we weren't supposed to talk about this, but today, like literally like a few hours before we went live, uh, Chevy re recalled 2017 through 2019 Chevy Bolt EVs because they're still catching on fire and spontaneously blowing up kind of thing. So um, the fix the fix that they implemented isn't working. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration said it's aware of at least one fire with a bolt EV that supposedly had the recall fix and it didn't work. Um, so it's not, it's not a great look, you know, GM says park the cars outside. Don't charge them overnight because they're afraid of it catching fire. They said, don't charge it past 90% and don't let the battery charge fall below 70 miles. So imagine owning a car and all of a sudden you have all of these like things you can't do and things you have to follow that's really stressful and hopefully it doesn't put a hurting on a GM and its image with EVs. Well, this is a perfect segue. I think now is a good time because I had asked the question a few minutes ago, what do y'all think Sean has in the driveway? He's making monthly payments on an EV right now. And a couple people answered one. Uh, Lasik said uh, mock E Aaron said uh, first time listener, no context, not sure. And then Derek responded, Hopefully it's not a Nissan Leaf if his poster is any indication <laughs> over your left <laughs> shoulder there, Sean. So, <laughs> uh, no, it's not. It's not a Leaf. It's not a Mach E. It's actually a Chevy Bolt EUV. Uh, here in my household, we got the very first one locally. Like it was the first one they had there. Um, really like it. And I had a Chevy Volt, as I've said on the sh on shows prior. Yes. Um, I really liked that car and really liked the Bolt EUV. Um, just like the look of it and it just fit what we were looking for here. Uh, so 30, 36 or 39 months with that guy and we'll see how it does. And then after that, we'll give it back nice. and 
kind of see see where the industry goes. You know, do we want another EV? Uh, do we like something better? Who knows? You know, 39, 36 months is a long time. Yeah, a, a, a lot will change in that time. I mean, at the pace things are currently moving, um, we're going to be into a whole next vehicle generation probably by that point. So, yeah. Um, but you you like the vehicle? It drives well? Yeah, I, you know, you get in and it's not a top of the line one. I think it's like one rung below. It's like a 2LT or however Chevy does its trim levels like that stuff. Um, and there's still like the traditional, like the door panels and the switch gear feels very Chevy GM, you know, for the price you're paying for this car. But I have to say they did a really good job of like actually putting like some detail into the vehicle. Like it has blue leather seats and like blue leather inserts everywhere, like a dark, like midnight blue. I'm like, this is yeah, yeah. really cool. Um, yeah. And yeah, there's like, sti- there's like fake stitching on the dashboard. You know, it's not real, but it looks nice. The display is super easy to use wireless Apple CarPlay, just tons of features. It does not have super cruise though. Uh, the dealer said they didn't have any of those and those were coming uh, a little bit later. Um, they were kind of uh, supposedly GM was trying to build ones without super cruise first. And I bet you that has everything to do with the chip shortage. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hilarious. It's, it's funny. I'm in a, a Chevy bolt this week, the small one, the standard bolt, not the EUV. And uh, I haven't had a, a chance bolt. to put too many miles on it. Yeah. Uh, I drove it yesterday to run an errand and the bolt doesn't, it doesn't drive particularly well, but it's, it's spunky. It scoots. And that's that's the big advantage of electric. You get that instant torque. There's no shifting. There's no engine noise. It just, it just moves. And this is a small, uh, you know, there's nothing special about it, but it works very well. So that's the big advantage of electric. Yeah, I think it's a great little package. Like you said, like it's not going to impress anybody like trying to do really fun things in it. You know, like I have a Honda S2000 for that. Like (laughs) I'm not going to take it on the same kinds of roads, but it's so relaxing to drive. It's just, it feels like carefree. You know, it actually has, I was so shocked. It doesn't have the premium audio in it, but the stock audio system in that car, I think is really good. It shocked me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Too bad about Super Cruise though. Maybe next time. Indeed, but maybe next time. We'll see. Who knows? Again, we got a while before that happens. But uh, that was a nice big off-ramp we took because we actually wanted to talk about one more Rivian thing. Uh, Even though they have some delays coming, they're they're confirming that they're going to build a second U.S. plant, even though they haven't officially delivered any of the cars rolling off the assembly line at their first plant. I was like, wow. Hmm. (laughs) That's a... That's a big, big move by Rivian. Uh, confirmed it with them. They're scouting locations, uh, according to a Reuters report, which first broke this news. Um, states are already like in, you know, a bidding war, rolling out the red carpet to get Rivian in their state, you know, to bring more jobs there, et cetera. Tax breaks, all that good stuff. Um, yeah. An evolving process, they say, you know, uh, uh, an official announcement could be pushed back further with the pandemic and stuff like that. So really no details, no idea what they want to build there, except they said it would be for vehicle production and battery cell production. So uh, Hmm. clearly they have a good, they have a good outlook for what they're doing. If they're like, yeah, we're going to build a second plant. You know, right now they're operating out of a old Mitsubishi plant in Illinois. And uh, maybe they just want something a little bit more state of the art. Who knows? Who knows? It's why I don't understand, like, why wouldn't you ramp up production at the one plant you have, get that at capacity, prove that you can build cars and, and make money selling them, and then start to consider another plant for additional product. It seems like they're putting the cart before the horse, but I don't know. I don't know yeah, the financial I, side of it. I kind of got the same feeling. It seemed like such a big announcement when you're like nowhere near at scale at your current plant uh you know you got three vehicles three vehicles you need to launch and start mass producing and you're just like hey guys we're gonna build another factory and you're like for what (laughs) uh but who knows you know they could be getting really aggressive you know amazon has huge investments in them amazon can probably be like hey we'll give you another billion dollars if you know you build us this and they're like yeah we'll just build another factory for it 
I'm just being. Yeah, uh, we've got I, all I this money. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe yeah, they can yeah. look at northeastern Ohio once, if you know Lordstown what they... <laughs> Motors uh, <laughs> subsides, they you know... can take that facility. Yeah, you know what they call that area now? That's like the Mahoning Valley is what they're trying to make work is the Voltage Valley. <laughs> oh, no. No, no. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's what they're trying to call it. It's because, uh, you know, okay. that, that's the old GM plant in Lordstown and uh, Lordstown Motors is currently there. Um, and then also GM and LG Chem are building a, a battery uh, assembly facility in that area as well. So like the locals are trying to be like, it's voltage Valley. And I'm like, guys, like, that's not a good name. (laughs) No, no. And like, so there's, there's, there's Lordstown motors there, GM and LG cam are doing stuff. So it's like three different companies. I feel you need like five before you can give a a place, a good local nickname. Right. I I just think they're jumping the gun. Yeah. I, I honestly, you know, and this is like a separate discussion. I feel like that's more of like a PR campaign because the area was just 110% gutted when GM said they were closing the plant. Oh yeah. And we've talked about this in the, in a past show too, yeah. that you can find. Um, it, it just really put a blow on that area. So I think it was more like, look, like not all is lost. Like it's voltage Valley. Now the future yeah. kind of thing. So I, I get it, but it's still not a good name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What would you have called it, Sean? Just kept it the Mahoning Valley. Yeah, just just call it what it is. You know, like we don't need we don't need a you know some fancy name. You know, like or let it come naturally if something pops yeah. up there. I don't know. Like the I'm dairy not even local. Yeah, exactly. I'm not even local to that area, so I have like probably no right of speaking. But you know, I'm local enough that like I understand what's going on there. But I don't think I should be yeah. on the committee to select a, a new name for the valley. Is what I'm getting at. <laughs> Yes, you should be, right? But uh, yeah, great uh, discussion this week, Sean. I appreciate it. And uh, we've gotten to the bottom of our rundown, so I think we uh, perhaps we should wrap this show up. What do you think? Yeah, that, I mean, that's the end. There's, there's no more uh, little details or bullet points left for us to talk about, but uh, we'll just take this moment to say, please go and subscribe to Roadshow News because that's where you'll find us going forward, no longer on this channel. If you come back here next week at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 Pacific, you won't find us. We're going to be on a separate channel, so we can't wait to see you guys at Roadshow News. And maybe they don't want to find us. I don't know, but I hope they I do. <laughs> So again, again Roadshow News. We appreciate it. Like, <laughs> yes, yes. Subscribe, like it, do whatever. You Share it on the social medias if you're involved in those sorts of things. Do and, TikTok uh, yeah. dances thank with you. it or something. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> yes. But uh, Sean, thank you so much for your expertise. And thank you, Evan Miller, our intrepid video producer, the man behind the scenes making this broadcast possible. Evan, thank you as always for your efforts. And of course, thank you for watching Roadshow uh, News Recap, where we dissect and discuss the latest automotive stories from the past week. As always, you can join us live for the Friday broadcast every week at 3 p.m. Eastern on the new Roadshow News channel or on Facebook. And with that, thank you all very much for watching. Take care and have a great weekend. Sean, are you there? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear, Craig. Let's get rolling then. Welcome to Roadshow News, our brand spanking new spin-off channel. Here we cover the latest in the transportation industry, whether it's our weekly broadcast on Fridays, other live streams, or even breaking news hits, there's a little something for everyone. And like finding money in your pants pocket or discounted tacos, we think you're really gonna love it. Subscribe today for weekly updates and maybe even some coupons. Well, maybe not coupons, but do what he said and subscribe.